thank you all so much for coming. I am touched and happy to see many of my friends, old and new, uh, at this talk. And I'm learning that a lot of you have gone, or who, your families have gone through similar experiences. So it's really nice that we're all flushed out together and can uh, uh, relate each other's histories. Anyway, what I'd like to tell you is something really about the background of this book and the major themes that uh, it deals with. And then I'll read a few passages, and then I'll just leave time for any questions or discussions. But it's very informal, so please feel free to ask questions or whatever as, as we go along. So this Rachel and Alex, this is a novel about the period 1918 to 1945. And it's a novel, but it's completely historically accurate. Um, there are many incidents in this book that are really not widely known about the Holocaust, and I hope that that, I mean, probably most people here know about Sugihara, for example, and other such people, but it's not generally widely known, and so I hope that the book will bring to light some of these uh, incidents that happened during the Holocaust. So... This is about the Second World War, and the major th there are several themes in the book. The major theme, of course, is the background of the Holocaust and the impact of historical events on individual lives. And it raises the question of, uh, you know, what makes one person survive and not another? How much, how much of our destinies are shaped by character and how much by chance? Um, obviously, it's like nature and nurture, right? It's both character and chance. Uh, but it's fun to contemplate, you know, what about if the character were a little different? Would that person have taken this risk or not taken that risk? And would that in turn have uh, started a cascade of whole other events? So it's, it's kind of fun to contemplate the back and forth between that character and chance. The point is that wars come and go. And um, there have been a lot of wars since the Second World War, Korea, Iraq, uh, Vietnam, and a million other regional wars all over the place. But to me, of course, and to many of you here, the Second World War is very personal because it involves our own family's histories. Now, the book is in three parts. The first part takes place in pre-war Poland, mostly, London, and so on, but pre-war Europe, and um, between the two world wars. So Rachel, who is the protagonist, grows up in this very strict family in a small town in Poland called Żarki, and really has a yearning to leave. She's not really totally fitting in. Um, but uh, she's rebellious and so on. She becomes involved with her Polish tutor because most of the uh, men in the family went to, uh, to Hebrew schools, but the girls were often educated in Polish schools. But she had a tutor because she wanted to go on to the gymnasium in Częstochowa and had to pass certain examinations. So this is a short excerpt from that part of the book. Rachel and Pavel walked in the forest every afternoon, staying longer and longer. But whenever their hands brushed by chance, they each drew away. Rachel imagined she was in a harness, pulled by Papa, sitting in his heavy chair in the living room, pulling, pulling on Rachel, as she strained invisibly to touch Pavel, so that last on a cloudy, chilly day, pine cones dropping around them, yellow leaves swirling in a sudden wind, their bodies touched, and she lunged forward in her imagination with a force that pulled the ropes out of Papa's hands. Her first step towards real independence, though, is when she moves to the larger town of Częstochowa and meets and falls in love with Alex. And so I'm going to read you a little passage from that section of the book. It was after Christmas in Częstochowa, mid-January, but the decorations were still in the store windows. Old Christmas trees were discarded on the sidewalks, while tinsel streamers still hung in windows of restaurants, and wreaths of holly were displayed on the heavy carved wooden doors of small apartment houses in the residential section of town. How strange this Christian world was, Rachel thought. How foreign and yet familiar to her. She lived in the midst of it, but she was not part of it. She remembered how one sunny day she had been walking in the woods outside of Jarki, and looking down saw a stream of ants cross her path. 
She had stopped to watch them as they scurried in almost a straight line, determined and purposeful, clearly intent on some momentously important task, caught up in their own universe and totally unaware of hers. And yet, she could have destroyed their whole nation with one footstep. She had hopped over them, careful not to disturb a single one in its mission. She thought of those ants as she walked along the streets of Częstochowa, thought of all the many different universes, each inhabited by its own creatures with their own purposes and problems, oblivious to all the others, separate. Her own personal universe centered on Alex. She wanted to possess him, and he would not yield to her. And then unfolds the relationship between the two. So now what I want to do is give you a little historical background. Germany was soundly defeated in 1918, and um, terrible times were coming. Uh, there was a hotbed of political events, and there was wide world inflation and depression and unemployment. In that context, the Germans allowed Hitler to get into power. Um, I mean, he was clearly a madman even then, but he had a very large following, and uh, he succeeded. It was a blend of rhetoric and um, rhetoric and terror, really, and masterful propaganda. Um, so he was in 1933. He was appointed uh, Chancellor of Germany, and shortly thereafter, the uh, Nazis burned the Reichstag building. They blamed it on the communists to really get Europe into a frenzy. Uh, because of the communists, and because of that, uh, the parliament gave Hitler dictatorial power. Um, and when von Hindenburg, the president, died in 1944, Hitler became the Fuhrer. And that's when uh, it started. Now, let us remember that Hitler won 90% of the popular vote um, approving all of these dictatorial powers. That figure really boggles my mind, that 90% of the democratic, quote-unquote, I mean, democratic uh, with a question mark, but nevertheless a vote, actually voted to give him those powers. So once he had them over the next several years, of course, all kinds of things happened, and particularly for the Jews, these incredible laws were enacted. Uh, Jews were expelled from universities, doctors could not practice medicine, teachers could not teach, health insurance was not available to Jews, shopkeepers could not. Uh, they were barred from many occupations. Now here is uh, uh, another interesting and horrible thing. Passports, German and Austrian passports, um, well, German German passports then, but after the Anschluss, also Austrian passports, um, had to, for Jews, had to have a big red J stamped on it, and all women's passports had to have a name Sarah included in their name, uh, and all men had to have the name Israel in their passports. So I asked my husband the other day, um, did he have his mother's passport? It's one thing to read. This is the list of the laws, the Nuremberg laws. The, you know, that's one thing to read about it, and it seems very abstract. But he found this passport, and there it is, J. So seeing it had a totally different effect. And, of course, the word Sarah is right there. So it really happened, because I, I think you sort of almost don't believe it really happened so persistently. Um, until you see something like that. Anyway, in March 1938, German troops entered Vienna, and there was the Anschluss, and the Austrians welcomed them with open arms, considering that they were liberated now because they were part of Germany. So Austria was very, much as I love Vienna, it was really very much pro-Hitler at the time. Um, then in October 38, they occupied the Sudetenland, and Chamberlain, of course, gave them Czechoslovakia, thinking that he would appease Hitler and that would end the war. But really, only Ch Churchill understood that you can't appease dictators or terrorists. Um, so things proceeded. And then, of course, on November 9th and 10th in 1938 was Kristallnacht. So Jews were arrested. It was the night of broken glass. 
businesses were looted, um, and about 20,000 Jews were sent off to a concentration camp. Dachau had already been opened in Germany at that time. So that's sort of the historical background. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and in the most remarkably fast um, action, by September, well, September 17th, the Soviets invaded Poland from the other side, because, you know, they were going to split it up into two. Uh, but by September 27th, so that's like three weeks, about three weeks after, uh, three and a half weeks after they invaded Poland at the border, they occupied Warsaw. And so that was the end of Poland. It was an incredibly fast blitzkrieg. Now, uh, England... Um, declared England, Switzerland, let's see, what else? Um, Not Switzerland. No, uh, no in, uh, sorry, Britain, France, Australia, and New Zealand declared war on Germany, and the United States was neutral at that time. So everybody in Poland certainly thought, well, within two weeks the British will come and wipe out all of this thing. Uh, but, of course, it lasted five, six years, and they didn't. Um Anyway, by the summer of 1940, the Germans had already occupied France, and it looked like they might invade Britain. So here is a brief excerpt um, on the eve of the war. Papa um, is visiting Rachel in Warsaw from, uh, from his small town in Jarki. He's visiting her, uh, spending the weekend in Warsaw. She's now living in Warsaw. On Wednesday, August 30th, 1939, she went to her bank and withdrew her savings. After supper, she gave the packet of money to Papa. You won't regret it, Papa said. She was to remember that in the dark years that followed. She never regretted it. Rachel, Alex said to her in bed that evening, you know I don't care if Papa stays with us for the weekend or the month or the year for that matter, but if you want him to get home for Shabbos, if you want him to get home at all, tell him to leave now. The next day may be too late. Early on Thursday morning, with an unreasoned urgency, she pleaded with Papa to go home to Jarki. It was August 31st. Don't leave Mama alone, she said. Well, Papa answered, I will go this afternoon. I have seen all the bank offices I could. No one wants to talk to me even. I can do all I can. I have done all I can. I was going to visit with you for the weekend, but I see things are a little tense here and Mama will be happy to have me home for Shabbos. He had come to Warsaw to borrow money from the banks to expand his business, of all things. Um, she saw him off on the train to Częstochowa. The platform was crowded with officers in full uniform, soldiers off on some assignment, kissing wives and babies, families with many suitcases going where? Do you have your ticket, Papa? Do you have your ticket? Her eyes were wet. Yes, Ruhala, come to see us next weekend. Come spend Shabbos with us. Mama complains you never come home anymore. I will, Papa, I will, the weekend after next, I promise. The steam from the train rose up on the platform. She blinked through it. He boarded the train. It began to pull away while he was still standing in the doorway, waving to her, saying something. The noise drowned out his words. Goodbye, Papa, goodbye, goodbye. I love you, Papa, I love you, she cried. She waited on the platform till the train was out of sight, the dim hum of the wheels, the only evidence of its existence. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. The next morning, on September 1st, 1939, in the gray early dawn, the Germans invaded Poland. And after that, all of those things unfold. Now, the second part of the book is called In Transit, and it's about the perilous journey out of Europe. So uh, to give you a sense of the Nazi dominion, I found this map, which is really remarkable. This is, this is the, uh, all the red are the na Nazi-occupied countries in Europe. And they were all occupied except uh, Britain, Spain, Portugal, and Switzerland. By 1942, really, uh, Germany basically owned or occupied all of Europe. So it was very hard to get out, um, obviously. But one of the amazing aspects of this period was uh, the role of foreign diplomats, and there are quite a few of them. 
And there was an organization called Visas for Life. They had an exhibit in the UN a few years ago. But they have this traveling exhibit. And they honor um, several of these diplomats. It started, actually, when they discovered Sugihara. Well, I guess Raoul Wallenberg was discovered first. But they discovered this Chuna Sugihara, who had been the Japanese consul to Lithuania at that time. And... Um, he, against his uh, government's orders, because Japan was an ally of Germany, issued transit visas to Jews who were escaping from Poland to get out, but couldn't because the Germans were on one side, the Russians, uh, I mean, there was no way to get out. So he issued those visas, and uh, the government did not give him permission, but he did it anyway on the strength of his conscience. And he issued 2,000 such visas, each of them was generally for a whole family. So my whole, f my, 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 my parents, my mother, father, and I were on this one passport. Um, and uh, he saved a lot of lives. Uh, it's estimated there, he saved about 6,000 people in all, and there are about 40 to 50,000 descendants of those people now. So you can imagine what an impact. Uh, that really was. So he was discovered after the war, really, uh, by one of the people he had saved who was in Israel and found him. And no one knew about him because he was dismissed from the government and, um, and so on. So here, is, um, here is Poland. And over here somewhere is Lithuania. And um, once he issued the visa... You could go to Japan, but you had to have permit from the Russians to go through Russia. From what I've read, I suspect that he really made some sort of a deal with the Russians to give the people that he gave the visas to permit to travel through. So then went through Siberia to Vladivostok, and from Vladivostok a short little hop to Japan, and then this was the Japan. Now Japan, of course, was a transit place, so people went to various other places. And then around to, really all the way around, um, from Japan, Japan is over here, from here to Seattle or San Francisco, and then to New York. So it was quite a long trip, as you can imagine, uh, over several years, actually. Um, but he made that possible, Sugihara, so that was really quite a courageous and amazing act. Now, here is a uh, little excerpt from that part of the book called Tra In Transit. It was all so accidental, Rachel thought, so accidental that they were still alive. The ship they had been on from Vladivostok to Japan sank on the voyage immediately following theirs. It was sheer chance that they were in Japan getting ready to go to America. And yet, and yet, after all, Rachel's fierce determination made her leave Moscow against all medical advice. They had, um, had they caught a later train across Siberia, they might have been on that sinking ship. Was she totally powerless or totally powerful? A dangerous train of thought, because if she was totally powerful, then it would have been within her power to save Sophie, her sister. And she hadn't. She was pulled backward by the recurring nightmare of Sophie left behind, of her parents' unknown fate. And she was pushed forward to America, by her daughter's future, by her husband's, and her own strong will to survive, and more than survive, to live. And so, when at last they stood at the railing of the Hiamaru, which would take them across the Pacific Ocean, when the loud blasts from the foghorn signaled their departure, and the freighter slid out of the dock, they were cut loose, like the ship, from the moorings of Europe. The last part of the book takes place in America. And this deals somewhat with the refugee experience, which is maybe which is different, I think, then than the immigrant experience, because the people who were refugees in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s were escaping for their lives, really, and um, they were, of course, always outsiders to the society that, that they came into. They were refugees. Um, but the theme here is the, the persistent, unalterable uh, 
influence that that kind of a Weltanschauung has, not only on the people who are the refugees, but on their children, and on, perhaps on their children, and who knows how far into the generations it goes, actually. Um, so th this, is, this is always an interesting theme, you know, how far does the culture transmit itself? Um, the point is that they certainly were always outsiders. So in the book, when Alex is contemplating his possible role in Poland after the war, Rachel's dismayed. You would not think of going back to Poland, Alex, Rachel asked with alarm. Who knows what will be after the war? This is my country now, but if I am needed, who knows? Um, there is no one left there. I could never go back. What are we, Alex, she said angrily. Poles, Jews, Americans, we're a little of everything and we're nothing. We're refugees. Well, I'm going to stop being a refugee. So that part of the book deals with, you know, with that experience. So, finally, against this background of war and escape and survival and so on, there is a love story in there, remember? This is a novel. Um, but that brings its own themes. Um, it brings its own themes of interest, I think. She gets involved with Roman, who is a rich businessman, very opposite from her husband in almost every way. Um, and, uh, you know, Freud's question, what do women want? So that's a question that she has to answer for herself. Um, now, remember that this is in the, where did she grow out of? What times, you know, was sort of just post-Victorian, really, right? And there women certainly wanted the security of a husband and of being taken care of, and, and, uh, and their status derived from the status of their husbands. Um, in the period of this book, most women expected men to take care of them. Um, most women did not work, but of course there were lawyers and doctors and uh, statesmen in Poland who were women, but they were very clearly in the minority. It wasn't as we had, what, over 50% women medical students? 57. 57. <laughs> uh, that was definitely not the case in those days. Um, but there's been a literature that, you know, Hedda Gabler and all these Ibsen plays where women tried to break out of the mold, but always paid an enormous price for it. Um, so many women had, uh, uh, in my generation now, that's sort of, you know, right after her generation, had this conflict of between really wanting to be independent and also wanting to be taken care of. And that was Rachel's conflict. Um, so my feeling, my belief is that this generation is completely exempt from that. But I don't know. I, I'd like to know what your experiences are. I mean, do women want alpha males? Um, or do they not want alpha males? Maybe, <laughs> Maybe you can tell me. Do, do men want... Alpha females for wives? <laughs> no? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and finally, the other theme in terms of the love story is, you know, what role does illusion play in our being able to fall in love or be in love? Do we need those illusions in order to fall in love and be in love? Or um, does love really begin after you're over those illusions and you of loving the person without the illusions. Uh, so that's another interesting question. So obviously there are no answers to these questions, but um, I hope that in reading the book, people might think of exploring them, those issues in their own lives. So I don't want to read too much because I don't want to give away the entire plot. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>